going to start this evening on 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 12. If you have that with you, and as you're turning there to 1 Corinthians 6, I hope you had a good 4th of July, and I hope it all went well with you. And I hope that, I pray that the that God has blessed you. But to be all honest, being honest with you, that this this time of year is just not a good time of year right now. If you're a true believer in Jesus Christ, you know what I'm talking about. It has seemed that in recent days, recent weeks, this world is on a collision course with destiny. And that destiny is God. There are some good things, believe it or not, that has happened because of what has happened in the prior weeks of this nation. God always sends a filter out to see, or He sends test, a test out to see if you're going to be one of those that are before Him or against Him. If you are for God, you will stand out for Him and against this world. If you are for the world, God will notice it first and foremost of all. This teaching is not for Episcopalians, Methodists, it is not for Jehovah's Witnesses, it is not for Baptists, it is for believers, it is for Christians. When our name is signed in the Book of Life, God does not categorize us by denominations. He does not categorize us by religions. He simply categorizes us as believers and non-believers. Jesus came not to set denominations, but to build His church. There's a difference. The church needs no identification because it identifies with the head of the church, Jesus Christ. There is a problem going on in the church today, and it has been for quite a while. And that is the reason why the weakening of the church is apparent. We are not the same church as when Jesus left it. The church has undergone many changes and unfortunately many of those changes are not good. The church is supposed to be the institution sent from heaven to be the light to the world, right? Unfortunately, the church has become more like the world. I had a friend of mine who was a Methodist and I was talking about the, with our deacon here. He has been a Methodist pastor. He works out where I work out at this gym. <clears throat> and he's in the Bull Verde area. He got a letter this week saying that because of the Supreme Court's decision to allow uh, to legalize same-sex marriage, the big their big committee, according to their denomination, the one who makes all the decisions for their denomination, sent him a letter saying, basically, you're going to have to do what the Supreme Court says. He's very troubled because he does not believe this. He believes God's Word. He believes the Bible. He called one of the big uh, hotshots, one of the board members of this committee of this denomination, and had a talk with him, pleading his case, saying, Look, I really believe God's Word, and, I, and I'm going to stick to my guns on this issue. Do I have to do this? Well, the board member says, Yes, because he was voted by the committee, and we was unanimous. And yes, every church of this denomination has to comply. So he says, Pete, it, it seems like I have to make a choice. I said, you have to make a choice every day if you're going to serve God or not. Right? Mm -hmm. He says, well, Pete, that means that I'm going to have to move my family. That means that we... I tell him, listen, and that he's a fellow pastor. I said, listen, you, 
when you were called to the ministry, did the Methodist called you, or did God call you? Amen. When you when you took that Bible, and you were going to follow God's word, are you going to follow God's word, or are you going to follow the bylaws of a committee? Are you going to follow Jesus, who is the head of the church, or are you going to follow Mr. So and So, who is the head of a committee? And he says, Pete, what? no, no buts. Either going to follow him or you're not. You're, you're irreplaceable, I told him. They'll find some other pastor that will do their bidding. They're not going to miss you. You're replaceable. You're a pawn in this grand scheme of things. And he looked at me and says, you mean to tell me that I'm going to have to resign? I says, no, you're going to have to follow Jesus. And if that involves resigning, you resign. And if that involves moving, you're going to move. I told him, your identity is not with a denomination. Your identity is a servant of Jesus Christ. And you're going to follow his word. Yes. And if that means resigning from your pastorship, you do it. If that means getting your family out of the parsonage to your own home, you do it. You do whatever it takes to follow Jesus. You do whatever it takes to follow your King, your Lord, your Messiah, your Savior. And God will take care of us. And God will take care of you. Like I say, you've been preaching for over a decade to your parishioners to trust God. Now it's your turn to trust them. Mm -hmm. And this is a big step for you because God is testing you to see if you're going to be for Him or against Him. He looked at me and says, Wow. He says, I guess that's what it comes down to. He says, that's exactly what it comes down to. Here's what it comes down to. To summarize it real quick. You're either going to love God or you're not. You're either going to serve Him or you're not. You're either going to obey Him or you're not. Paul found this out in the church of Corinth. Let me give you a little background to this church in Corinth. This Corinthian church was a major church. They were big. They were huge. Many members, they were located in the near the metropolis of Athens, Greece. Ah, yes, Athens, Greece. The famous Athens, Greece, where the Olympics started, and um, the famous Greece where many of the fables came forth. Athens, Greece was the world in a city. Anything that you could think of, only Rome had was more worldlier than Athens. And the Church of Corinth, even though they were made up of believers and had a lot of people in it, here was the thing. When it came down to actually serving Jesus, to serving God, there was a problem. What was the problem? The problem was this. When it came down to really serving Jesus, they had to make a decision within the church whether to be to follow him or not. There was a saying that Paul said to this church in Corinth, which he spent one and a half years in. He says, stop being a Corinthian and start being a Christian. What does that mean? Stop being a worldly person and start living for Christ. Amen. Paul was in Corinth for three years, from 49 to 52 AD, and he stayed in this church for one and a half years. Paul was sage, he was bold, he was focused. He was exactly what this church needed. He stuck to the truth of Jesus Christ, he did not compromise, he did not, he, he did not, he was not in disfavor, he was not scared of anyone. The Corinthian church though had a reputation for being dysfunctional, for being worldly. As a part of Greece they focused on, on intellectualism and sensualism as part of their so-called religion. They were worshipping such gods as Isis and Zeus in Athens. Wow. And some of those people went to church because they liked what Jesus taught. The problem was they never left what they were doing. Yeah. Instead, they added Jesus to the mix and had their own Christianity. Well... The problem with churches today is because of this ruling that has happened. And it's been building for a long time. We're going to find out which people are really going to serve Jesus and which people are not. 
We're going to find out who's going to stand for Jesus or who are going to cower down to political correctness. Remember who you're serving. You are serving Jesus Christ. Every decision you make is either for or against Him. And that will be taken into account. Every word that you say, everything that is done, will be done in, in favor or against Jesus. I'm going to read to you some passages that are very stunning. And a lot of people are not going to like these passages. Because it cuts to the heart of where they're coming from. Start in verse 9 in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Listen very carefully. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, first, before we get started into this. First of all, do you believe God's word at all? Okay. Do you believe there is a God? Do you believe there's a Jesus? Do you believe there's a heaven and a hell? Do you care? For my friends that are lost, they're not my friends, for those that are lost, every day that you live in ignorance does not make God cease to not exist. In other words, your unbelief does not make God not exists. He will exist whether you believe Him or not. Do you understand? There's a judgment day whether you believe it or not. There's a, there's a day of reckoning whether you believe it or not. It doesn't matter in your own little world of ignorance. God is still there. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. And it doesn't matter what your parishioners, what your, what your priests, what your pastors, what your committee, what your convention say. It doesn't matter what the Supreme Court says. It doesn't matter what anyone else says. The only one that matters was one that was here over 2,000 years ago. The Son of God came and declared who He is and who, who He is not only for now but forever. And He made it very plain. You either love me or you hate me. You're either for me or you're against me. That's what Jesus said. And what I'm about to read to you is considered hate speech by those that do not believe. Have you ever noticed the ones that don't believe they call this hate speech? Have you, do you sense a pattern there? That means that, you, and here's the thing, don't focus your attention on me, focus your attention on the one who wrote it. Get your little bitty, itty bitty sticky finger and point it out to the Almighty God and see who's going to win that battle. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Period. Look at the next three words, or four words, excuse me. What does it say, the next four words? Do not be deceived. Have we heard that last week? Galatians 6, 7, what does it say? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Do not be deceived, right? Mm -hmm. You have been deceived if you believe that God does not exist. You have been deceived if you think that the unrighteous, oh, listen, it doesn't matter what you do or say, we're all going to go to heaven. No, no, you're not. Okay? Do you understand what we're saying here? Here's the hate speech. You ready for this? This is considered hateful speech in today's churches. Ready? Do not be deceived, neither the fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let's stop there. What I just read to you in the eyes of unbelievers, in the eyes of the ignorant, that is called hate speech. Then Jesus taught a lot of hate speech. Amen? Amen. Jesus Christ, when He was on this earth, He taught a lot of hate speech, folks. When Jesus says you either for me or against me, that was hate speech. When Jesus says that this is a sin, that was considered hate speech. Mm -hmm. Well, judge not, you're not supposed to judge. The Bible says by their fruits you shall know them. That's not judging. Mm -hmm. The devil has deceived our society 
into believing that everything is all right. The devil has given you an attitude. It's no big deal. The devil has given you an attitude of equality is essential. The devil has given you an attitude that we should care for our fellow man in our own human, secular humanistic way. Did Jesus come to divide or did he come to unite? Hmm. Is Jesus a divider or is he a uniter? All I have to do is show you in the book of Matthew chapter 24 where Jesus separated what? The sheep from the goats. Does that sound like unity? The wheat from the tares. Does that sound like unity? Hmm. On judgment day, those that will go to heaven and those that will be cast into hell. Does that sound like unity? No. That sounds like separation. There is a separation that is legal and godly, and that is according to, to the merits of Jesus Christ. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to stand out and you're going to be persecuted and you're going to be hated. They're going to hate your guts. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be called, called a, a, a monger. You're going to be called a bigot, a right-wing extremist. Every name in the book that they can throw at you. But see, they would call Jesus the same thing as well. And they have. They would call God the same thing. This is how ignorant they are. This is how stupid they are. Now look at verse 11. My dad was a pastor. He was a pastor over 20 years. There was an incident that happened in Seguin toward the end of his ministry before he retired. Let me tell you what happened. There was this couple that came to Emmanuel Baptist Church. It's no longer functioning right now. The building's still there, but the church is not. This couple came to him and they wanted to get married. The girl is the daughter of another well-known pastor. Okay? The guy was an ex-homosexual. He gave his life to Jesus Christ. He repented of his sins and he turned to God. Her family was divided. Her family was really torn. But he was steadfast. I mean, he was baptized and he believed in his heart that Jesus Christ was his Savior. And he left his way. He stopped. No one else would marry him. After much prayer and counseling, he married them. And the reason he married him was this. Because he believed in the X Factor. That's the name of this teaching called the X Factor. He was no longer a practicing homosexual. He was an ex-homosexual who was following Jesus Christ. He married them. Did not see or hear from them for a long time. Well, that changed when dad went home to be with the Lord. Who do you think was one of the ones that were there to pay their respects? It was that couple. They had two girls. And they were still married and they were still going to church. He came to mom and thanked mom for dad and said, thank you. I thank your husband because he knew and he saw my fruits and he knew that I was a born again Christian. There is power in the blood, amen? amen? Jesus can change your life too. Look at Paul, what he says here in verse 11. 
He says here, after he went over the list of fornicators, homosexuals, adulterers, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, extortioners, haters. Look what he says in verse 11. He says, did you know that such were some of you? What is the church made up of? Perfect people? Is the church made up of good people? Is the church made up of holier than thou people? No. The church is made up of what? Saved sinners. <laughs> we are saved. We are saved sinners. We have people in the church that will curl your hair. Do you understand? We got people in the church that were egg Satan worshippers. I know a couple. Yep, I know a couple myself personally that was involved in satanic worship. A lot of people would have turned their back and said, we don't want none of this, no way, no way, no way. Folks, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, all that past should remain the past. Amen? Mm -hmm. And all you should have is a present and a future. You don't be scared of people that have a past. As long as the past stays in the past, you're fine. Okay? If walking beside them is Jesus Christ and holding their hand, they're fine. Paul reminded them, listen church, before you get so high and mighty and high falloon and that you're a mega church and that you're all that in the bag of chips, let me remind you who you really are in the eyes of God. You are an ex-idolater, an ex-adulterer, an ex-homosexual, an ex-sodomite, an ex-thief, an ex-hater. You are exes, he says. Jesus came to save you and put an X on you so that you wouldn't be that anymore. Hmm. And why were they why were they X? Here's why. Because they were washed, number one. Because you were washed by the blood of Jesus. For those people out there that don't understand this, here's what it is. Do you want to know why there's sheep and goats in the church? Here's why. Because the sheep have been washed by the blood of Jesus while the goats have not. The sheep that are washed by the blood of Jesus will follow the shepherd. Which means what? It means real simple. They will follow the word of Jesus and they will obey his gospel. If you're a goat, you will question God, you will debate God, you will debate His Word, and you will follow your own way. You're intellectuals. You will analyze and reason. You are politically correct. You care nothing about God, you care nothing about His Word, and you care nothing about the future. All you care about is being accepted and loved by a society that's bent on going to hell, basically, right? Well, that's pretty harsh. Let's look at John the Baptist. You want to talk about harsh? How many of you remember John the Baptist? Wore camel hair, ate locusts and wild honey. He was in the wilderness and he was preaching the gospel. People call him a madman. One day he made an enemy called Herod. Remember King Herod? He was a bad boy, King Herod. Not only did he want to do away with when Christ was born, all the babies, he was the one that instituted the first abortion in the New Testament. But he did something wrong. See, he went after his brother's wife and got her. Okay, committed adultery, right? Bad boy. Mm. But see, people were scared of him because he was the king. No one dared to tell the king he was doing wrong or that he was sinning, right? Except for one John the Baptist. When John the Baptist heard this, he says, Listen, what you are doing is wrong. And he would point him out and says, You need to repent of your sins and turn to Christ. Did you know that John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus Christ? Why is that important? Here's why. We'll get to that point in a minute. John the Baptist was in the wilderness, baptizing in the name of Jesus Christ. He was calling people out for their sins, and he went after the king and says, King, you're committing sin. You're committing adultery. Now let me ask you this question. In today's society, would he be considered hate speech if he did that? Were they considered hate speech? John the Baptist shouldn't have done that. He's not. He's a judge. He should not judge. He wasn't judging, folks. He was calling out what was obvious. He was telling, and he said he didn't derail him. He said, "Repent of your what sin. Repent of your sin. Turn to God." He was not berailing him. He was teaching him the gospel. See, this is the gospel. The gospel is this: that we're all our sinners, and that we need to turn to Jesus Christ. We're all born into sin. Okay. That means that we are born sinners. That came from Adam and Eve. That did not come, that God did not create us sinners. 
sin happened in the Garden of Eden. Do you understand that? Okay. The devil, Satan, sin was found within himself. It was found within himself, and he wanted to be worshipped as God. Read Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. You got that, Kathy? Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. Okay, that? Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted to be worshipped as God. Okay. That is called sin. What does the word sin mean? Okay. For those that don't know what sin means, you have to know what it means. Because if you don't, you miss the whole picture. We're going to come back to this in a minute. Sin means to rebel. To rebel, to go against, to oppose. When you're sinning, you're rebelling. You're going against, you're opposing authority. You are opposing God's law, God's authority. That is not good. Do you understand that? That's not good. You will always lose when you go against God. Are you listening? You will lose. You disobey God, you will be cursed. You won't be blessed. What are we saying here? This is what we're saying. Everything that you have said and done against God will be held accountable. You will have to pay for your sins. And if you can't pay for your sins, you will be in eternity for hell to pay for your sins. But that's considered hate speech. Right? Folks, this philosophy of judge not lest he be judged is from the devil. The devil has twisted the scriptures to intimidate people. The devil is a liar and a deceiver. Are you listening? He's deceiving a lot of people. And not only is he deceiving a lot of people, a lot of people are going... They, here's the sad part. They're going down the wrong road and it's going to be too late. And the sad part is this, is that the church of Jesus Christ should be the leader in preaching repentance for our sins. We should be the light of this world and we should be the dominant factor in telling, G in telling others about Jesus. But we, for you Methodists, for you Episcopalians, for your Seventh-day Adventists, for your Church of Christ, and for all your religions out there that have these little bitty skirmishes of what is right and what is not, all you're doing is debating among yourselves, you're cowering into what the world is saying, you are becoming politically correct, you are weakening the Word of God through your insufficiency and insubordinance, and you are going against God's Word. And you will have to answer to God for what you have done in the name of Jesus. And you're going to do it in your souls, every soul that goes to hell because of you, you're going to account for it. You are responsible and you are, are liable for what you're doing against God's word in the name of political correctness and acceptance in this world. And that is, a, that is a darn shame because parents now do not have the gumption to tell their kids to do what is right. Parents now are cowering in and they don't want to hurt feelings. Let me tell you about feelings, folks. Feelings is just feelings. It comes and it goes. But heaven is real and hell is real and they're forever. Once you go to hell, you stay in hell. You don't get out of it. Are you listening? The only way that you can avoid it is to repent of your sins and turn to Jesus now, today, this second, this minute. Change your ways. And if your church condones this, you get up, you take your pocketbook with you, you take your kids with you, you take your if you have a plant there, take your plant with you and get out of there. Come see crosswalk with you. This is serious. And here's the thing. You know, everyone talks about this. Let's be happy. Are you happy? Let's be joyous. Very. What about God? Is He happy? With me? You think God is happy with this country right now? Do you think Jesus is just dancing in heaven over what's been going on? Do you think Jesus is proud of His church right now? Are you listening? Do you think Jesus, is He proud of you? Is He pleased with you? 
Is he pleased with what you've been doing? Is he pleased with your actions? Is he pleased with your words? Is he pleased with your direction in life? Is he pleased?